here. We'll start recording. Um, hopefully I won't have any problems tonight. Uh, changed over to Mojave. Uh, Mac did that update. And I'm, uh, now I'm sitting here wondering whether or not the Windows update or the Mac update's worse. So there you go. <laughs> anyway, you go. You, you kind of feel like you're looking at the situation. Here, you know? <clears throat> they say it's all going to get better. They say it's all going to get better. All right, last time we met was two weeks ago. We talked about the idea of law, okay? And I just kind of remind you, this being, like I said, a couple of weeks. What my plan is for the rest of the semester is we're going to go continue to go over the rest of this on how to uh, uh, interpret these various types of scripture, poetry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then what I'm going to do is spend some time going back over how to study the Bible where he starts talking about biblical silence. Because again, my opinion, and again, and this is my opinion if I was writing the book at all, but I didn't, so I can't say anything about him. But my opinion would be you teach how to go through the interpretation, then you start trying to figure out all the rest of this stuff, silence, biblical expediency, and all that other stuff. And he does it backwards from what I do. So that's, that's just the way that is. And maybe next time after further cogitations on my part, then I will decide to go with his way. I don't know. So that's what the plan is. Um, last time, like I said, we talked about, and I'm just going to cover the quickly what we covered, the four major collections of laws. Remember, we talked about the covenant code. You remember that? I know it's been two weeks. Everybody remembers that, right? Here's your midterm exam. Do you remember that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. You do. Ah, well, good, good, good. You, you got it wrote down, so that's what's important. You have the covenant code, which is Exodus 20, 22 through 23, 33. What's the second one? The Deuteronomic code, where again, you read Deuteronomy 12 through 26. The What is the third one? Only this code, and that's mainly dealing with the book of what? Leviticus, right? And then the priestly code, again, where some of that is in the book of Leviticus, but also in Exodus 25. And then we talked about casuistic law. The casuistic law is talking about if this happens, then this is what's supposed to happen. So, for example, in Exodus 21, if men quarrel and one hits the other with a or fist and does not die but is confined to bed, okay? So you have, here's the condition, and then here's the penalty. The one who struck the blow will not be held responsible if the other gets up and walks around, but he must pay the injured man for the time. We talked about uh, apodictic law, which means, again, uh, you know, it's unconditional categorical directives. In other words, you shall not murder, 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 murder okay? Honor your father and mother, okay? Those are laws that, that have no change about it. What is the participle law? Capital crimes, again, uh, simply if you put this person to death, you die, right? You kill somebody, you die. Uh, also under the Old Testament law, but we don't really read anything, any situation where it actually took place, but under the Old Testament law was the idea that if you commit found committing adultery, it was death. It was a death penalty. So there was no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And then the law of retaliation, which was that? Like an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And again, uh, the ideal is was to limit, not to limit the vengeance. And then we go to Romans chapter 12, where he emphasizes the idea of, he says, vengeance is mine, I will recompense, says the Lord. And this is about where we got down to last time. Am I correct? All right, now here's some principles of interpretation when it comes to law. All righty? Principles of interpretation. And again, when we really get into this situation, we're going to start talking about uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and things along this line. Um, the Old Testament law presents a select sample of cases or topics whose legal principles were to guide in Israelite individuals, the larger community, in making the decisions and living out the worldview. The idea was is that it gives you some of these samples, okay? So, example, we would talked about the ideal of slavery in Exodus chapter 21 and why, what they needed to do in that. And a lot of those laws would be instructional, not necessarily judicial. In other words, this is how they were explaining how the law should be worked out rather than actual case laws, okay? Um, 
So that's, that's what he's talking about. Now, think about this idea. Does the Old Testament law apply to Christians today? No or yes? Let's be careful. <laughs> yeah. Let's be careful. <laughs> and again, I, and again, I emphasize this. In the Old Testament law, we see how God dealt with man back before, obviously, Jesus came upon the earth, but also to emphasize, well, what was the purpose of it? Galatians chapter show, 2. Show us what sin was. Yeah, show us what sin was. It was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Galatians chapter 3 brings that idea. It, it emphasizes to us that we could not be perfect on our own. We could not live a perfect life. And therefore, if I didn't do that, then what? I would be forever lost. And it showed us, and this is what Paul brings out in Galatians chapter 3 in very clear terms uh, about that idea. So we understand that we're not under that Old Testament covenant, but does it teach us anything? Does it help us to understand just how strict God's demands for holiness was? Yes. We know that it can never, what, make us perfect because we could not keep the law perfectly, right? But it emphasizes at the same time how holy God is and how we would have to reach this level of standard if we're going to be acceptable unto him. So in that respect, we understand that God is trying to, even in this behalf, and think about the only person that ever kept that law perfectly was Christ Jesus. And why did he keep that law perfectly? Phil, to, to fulfill Phil. it, right? Matthew chapter 5, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And again, a lot of people think that whenever we, as the, as emphasize the idea that we're not under the Old Testament law anymore, they think that we are trying to dismiss it and say that it's not important. That's not what we're trying to do. Jesus fulfilled the law. If you fulfill a, a covenant, then what? There's no longer a Bible. We understand that principle. Uh, yeah. And that's it. He satisfied the requirements of it and put it aside. The best way we could maybe understand this idea today, if we're trying to explain it to somebody, is the idea like in the situation with me. I, when my father passed away, I had a truck and he had a truck and I traded both trucks in and I made, I bought that truck. And that's a 2010 Nissan Frontier. I still owed, you know, a certain amount of money, but we was able to pay it off within three years. All right. Now what happened at three end of three years, the bank, they had no say on about what I could do with that truck anyway, manner, shape, size, form. It was nothing. I fulfilled that covenant. Do they have any, do I, do they have any claims on me whatsoever? No. Absolutely not. In the same respect, Jesus fulfilled that covenant. So there would be no claims against him whatsoever. And because he was the only one that was able to do that, that made him the perfect sacrifice. So then we are baptized into Christ, Romans chapter 6, right? And also Galatians chapter 3. We are therefore in Christ, and we are able to uh, enjoy the privileges of what he did in fulfilling that law. Now, at the same time, and I want us to think about this and really think about this. If we are striving to be Christ-like, and we are, 1 Peter 2.21 says that we are to walk in his steps. Romans 8, 29 says we are to be conformed to his image. And if he kept that Old Testament law perfectly, should that not be our goal and holiness in our own lives? Yep. So you see that I'm, what I'm trying to say here. A lot of times we dismiss the Old Testament law and say it really has no impact upon us. And that is true. But at the same time, we have to see that the Old Testament law was a holiness code to help us to see what God would demand for all of us as we're striving to be holy. Jesus will emphasize it and ramp it up a notch. For example, you shall not commit murder in Matthew chapter five. He gives right. us a command. You've heard it was said, but I say unto you, what? Even if you think of a man. Yeah. If you're angry with yeah. a man, then what? 
you've already committed murder. Without a cause, you've already committed murder. So you see, he's not just dealing with the actual sin itself, but the motive behind the sin. And with the heart. That's right, with the heart. He uses another example. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery with her already. Does this speak to us about the problem of pornography? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it absolutely does. And again, so as I'm trying to live the Christian life and be what God wants and expects of me to be, I'm not going to allow pornography to be, you know, a part of me. And yet we often read about the idea of in the church today, <clears throat> conservative, and I'm using Christendom as a whole, not just specifically the church of Christ, but we see that up to, uh, from surveys they've had up to 65 to 70% of preachers have a problem with pornography. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And that's across all denominations. Now you're sitting there thinking, okay, well, what's happened in, in the world that's causing this? And if that's the case in the denominational world, do you think we're anywhere close to that in the church? May very well possibly be. Uh, I know of brothers that have come and talked to me about it. So the point I'm trying to make, and I, I think that's, again, the emphasis that I want to emphasize to you, is that we are a lot of times are very quick to dismiss the Old Testament and say we don't need, I've even heard people say, well, that's the Old Testament, I don't have to study that. No, no, that's, that's erroneous thinking, because that Old Testament is there to help us to be seeing what we have in Christ, but it also emphasizes to us what God and demands when he's asking for us to live holy lives. And so you see, in that respect, now you're saying, well, you're going to kind of weigh, by what you're saying, Tommy, you're kind of saying that we are under it. Well, again, it's the ideal of what? It's the ideal of trying to be like Christ, right? I'm not trying to keep that Old Testament law so that I could work my way to heaven. I can't do that. But I'm going to try to keep it and understand why it was given so that what? I could be like my Lord. And so, what we do, and so that we don't make the same mistakes that the Israelites made, which we're prone to do. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've been studying a lot about that. Even recently, I've been preaching or teaching in our Bible class at South Cobb, the idea of prophecy and some of the things that Israel was doing. And last week, I talked about the book of Amos. And in this book, he was writing to the 10 northern tribes during a time of very, uh, there was a time of peace. The Assyrians weren't knocking at their door at this point of the grain, but during the time of Jeroboam II, there was a lot of wealth. And he talks about people lying on beds of ivory. In other words, they're just, they're just, life is great. Life is good. They have whatever they want. They, wives would send their husbands out and and read Amos very closely. He would send their husbands out and they would bring in all this stuff from the wives. Amos doesn't pull any punches. He says, now listen, you cows of Bashan. You know, he's talking about their wives and he calls them cows. And I thought to myself, if I was to get out and talk to ladies, cows at South Cobb, I'd be <laughs> herding cows from there on out. You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> but you know, and, that, and Amos, it didn't bother Amos. But he would talk about how their wealth had caused them to just give themselves over to leisure and to sin. And he says, okay, now you're not trying, even trying to worship God the way you need to. And so we sit back and look, and I wonder sometimes if some, and I think you understand what I'm trying to say. I wonder if sometimes we, in the church, we say, well, that was back then. We don't have that problem now. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We have a lot of wealth. We have a lot of, and God's blessed us with it. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but there's sometimes our wealth, and our desire for things get in our way of God. Absolutely. So you see, the things that we're emphasizing here is we have to try to understand the timeless truth that is to obey there, okay? So, um, and then you look at that, that as Christ fulfilled the Old Testament, uh, Matthew goes on to contrast Jesus' code of ethics as opposed to the law of Moses. To fulfill a law must mean to bring it to completion everything for which the law was originally intended. We know from Colossians 2 that the ritual aspects, the sacrifices, 
were done away with by Moses, right? Um, <clears throat> one person put it like this. All of the Old Testament, are you listening? Applies to Christians, but none of it applies apart from its fulfillment in Christ. Okay? Yeah, quick catch. I didn't want to lose this computer. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, that's a lot of money. But anyway, <laughs> it, you know, <clears throat> so the bottom line is, as we're looking at this, you know, there's some big ideas about this. We understand that, again, we're not under that Old Testament law, but should we study it? Yes. Should we be emphasizing it in the church? Yes. Why? For the very reasons I've stated. So what are your thoughts? I can't imagine life without the book of Proverbs and Psalms and... Mm -hmm. You know, first, first and second Kings and all, the, the whole entire Old Testament, it just builds upon the, mm -hmm. the New Testament. It makes you understand the lifestyle and how the Jews got to the situation where they were. Okay. All right. You were saying, brother? The Bible tells me that it was written, the poor was written for our learning. Right. And also, when you want to learn, scheme of redemption for man mm -hmm. to go to the Old Testament. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. New That's right. Any other comments, thoughts? Okay. If you don't agree with that, just at least spend some time on it and think about it. Like I said, I never thought about it until I was starting again trying to teach this class and I was going through this and I thought, yeah, that's right. You're, you're making a good point here. So we need to understand that in that respect. Um, think about the idea, how does the sacrificial laws, how does that apply to us? Well, we just think about our once for all sacrifice Jesus made. Hebrews, the ninth chapter said, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. But every time we think about what it would take for them to come into the presence of God, right? With the blood of an animal. Yeah. Then you think about the ideal of what Jesus did that, that one time. And he went into the Hebrew writer will say, he went into the most holy place. Where? He's in heaven. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, that the, the book of Hebrews is a, is a very good example mm -hmm. of why we should have the knowledge of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is so, so true. It's not just that, but Romans. Romans pulls a lot off of the Old Testament idea. Every one of them, Paul, a lot of times will quote from the Old Testament over and over again. So, uh, you know, think about the idea of some laws, as I said, even in the New Testament, they were kind of, what do we say? We kind of brought them over, right? At the mouth of two or three witnesses, what? Every word shall be established. Is that true of the New Testament? Yeah, Matthew 18. Whenever I have a problem with a brother, I try to talk to that brother with me and him alone. But if that doesn't work, what? I take with me two or three witnesses, right? So you see, that's even brought over in the New Testament in that respect. Think about the idea. Uh, some of the laws in the Old Testament are much stricter than those in the New Testament. All righty. Under the Old Testament law, you could get a divorce for anything, right? Deuteronomy 24, if you don't like your wife anymore, give her a certificate of divorce because you have found some uncleanness in her. And again, this is a whole other study that we could spend time on, but you heard probably sermons where, what does the word uncleanness mean? Some people think the word uncleanness in Deuteronomy 24, if she gets up one morning and burns biscuits, that's, that's the reason that, you know, you have found something you didn't like about her, so you can send her packing, right? You're laughing, right? <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> and I mean, that's about the way it is with our world today when it comes to divorce. I yeah. fell out of love with her. She didn't do what I thought she'd do. He didn't do what I thought. So we get a divorce just for any other reason. But in the New Testament, what? You know, Jesus says there has to be adultery involved. And even in that respect, you don't necessarily have to get a divorce, right? You can work through it, but that is the only scriptural reason for divorce. All righty. Only in the case of adultery. Um, Galatians chapter five, we are not, we don't have to circumcise our children, but it does talk about circumcision in the ideal of the circumcised heart, right? You know, the ideal of cutting around. So again, um, 
God takes a lot of these sacrifices very seriously. But again, what's the purpose? Anytime you killed an animal and you saw that blood gush out on the ground and you sprinkled some of it on the altar, you would begin to, you would literally physically see what forgiveness cost. Could it be that maybe we take forgiveness from God very much for granted because we didn't see him on the cross? We didn't actually see what he went through. We can only picture it in our mind. But could it be that that's, that's involved there? So, uh, you know, so there's, there's what we're talking about. So, again, think about this in this respect, and, and if you have anything else to say about it, let's, let's talk about it. So how do you interpret legal material? Number one, how do you interpret legal material? Time to write again. Number one, study the surrounding laws because a lot of times they are topically arranged. All righty. The collection in which the individual laws appear serves as its literary context. So he will talk about the Exodus 20, the 10 commandments. And then in chapter 21, he starts giving us examples of how this, this is to play out. All right. Uh, so study the surrounding laws since they are often topically arranged. All right. Study the surrounding law since they are often topically arranged. Got that? Number two, endeavor to learn the original meaning of the laws in light of their cultural background. In other words, try to figure out what the original meaning of the law was in that background. So that means you're going to have to do a little bit of study with dictionaries, commentaries, things along that line to help you understand that a little bit more. Other background sources. All right. Learn the original meaning of the laws. Learn the original meaning of the laws in light of their cultural background. Okay. If a person in the first century were to come today, somehow or another, if there was a time machine that they can bring into the 21st century and they actually see roads and cars going by, they would not have a clue in the world what in the world is going on. Right? The closest they would possibly understand is horseback ride or a chariot running down a street. But I'm sure they had no, <laughs> I'm sure they didn't have a speed limit sign anywhere up and down those streets at that time. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? But again, if they were looking 45 miles an hour, and again, back in those days, they probably thought if we ever went that fast, we would just disintegrate. You know what I'm trying to say? So you see, they would not understand our laws in our culture. We, a lot of times, don't understand their laws in their culture. So that necessarily means we're going to have to spend a lot more time trying to get that cultural law, all right? Number three. Did everybody get that? Okay, number three. Apply the laws to their Christian counterpart of the original audience. Apply laws to their Christian counterpart of the original audience. So let's, let's look at it this way, applying the laws to their Christian counterpart. So remember, we talked about one group of law was the priestly code, right? Now, who are the priests of God today? We are. We are. So think about going back through Leviticus. I know we all love to read that book, right? We just <laughs> it very, very much. But if we looked at Leviticus as priests, and by the way, we all are priests. What from Leviticus is he trying to emphasize to all of us today? It's hard work. Huh? Holiness, hard, hard work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, being set apart. Okay. Now, again, you see, so maybe then if you started reading the book of Leviticus, and again, as I said, we all love to read that book, right? We just, we just fall in love with it every time we read it. We're just sitting there saying, thank you, God, that I don't have to do that, right? <laughs> but what if we looked at it from a different, different colors, eye glasses? All right, this is written to priests. What did Jesus, or what did God demand of those priests in the Old Testament? And how can that apply to me today? 
and see if you don't really gain a whole nother perspective of what we have and what we should be today. Now, again, we're not going to be dressed in the high priestly robes. We're not going to be, you know, killing animals. Think about how bloody that job must have been. Think about how on the day of Pentecost, the priest would have to offer those sacrifices for every family that come walking up through there. Slaughterhouses, you know, it doesn't even begin to describe it, right? Think about all the blood. And it's, it's kind of goes back to, again, what one brother said. Uh, brother Frank Chester wrote some commentaries on, on the Bible. He said, you, if, you could li if you could do it figuratively, if you could prick the Bible with a needle, it would bleed because there's blood all over the place. So and there's the idea that we, we're trying to get across. Again, think about how it applies to us. And then number four, number four, <clears throat> the reader must decide whether to apply the legal material literally or in principle. Now, again, the Old Testament legal principles, again, it's mainly gonna be in principles, not literally, right? We must decide whether to apply the Old Testament legal material literally or in principle. So think about it in, in that respect. All righty. All right, that's law. That's the law part. All right. Now let's start talking about poetry for a minute. All right. In there's types of Old Testament poetry. Now we're still talking about the Old Testament. We haven't gone into the New Testament. No. All right, but let's talk about the Old Testament poetry. A lot of times, a lot of poetry are prayers, right? Psalms 22. Most of us, uh, most of us know that. <clears throat> Psalms 22 is a, we have often used to talk about the idea that that is a passage that deals with crucifixion. Starts off, my God, my God, what? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? So this is really a prayer, is it not? And he's crying out to God. And how many of the Psalms are prayers? Well, a lot of them are, right? So again, we have to understand that a lot of times you have these prayers. And so as we're looking at this, you have uh, songs or prayers. Uh, like I said, for example, in Psalms 22, let's notice how this prayer starts off. It invokes God's name. It talks about the confidence they have in God. Uh, then you have the ideal of God, why have you forsaken me? Why, why do people look at me in these, in these situations? You have them asking for help. And then at the end of it, he talks about thanksgiving, thanksgiving of how God has delivered him through that situation. So a lot of times in the Old Testament poetry, you find a lot of prayers. And a lot of these prayers can be what you might call lament psalms. They're praying or they're complaining, all right? <clears throat> a second kind of psalm is what we call the imprecatory psalm. Now, that's a big word. It's I-M-P-R-E, I-M-P-R-E, C-A-T-O-R-Y. And this is where we really have some problems because this is where a lot of times the person that's writing the psalm, now again, remember they're being inspired by God to write it, where they're asking God's vengeance on their enemies. God, wipe them out for me, if you would. <laughs> you know, and, that, and this is where a lot of people really sit back and say, well, and that's how the Old Testament and the New Testament is so much different because, no, you're not going to ask for your enemy. What does Jesus tell us to do in the New Testament? Love, them. love our enemies. Love them, forgive them, right? Uh, we read and, and you think about it where they would pray and, and, and ask for their enemies not necessarily to be destroyed. A lot of this could go back to the idea of what we call, remember, hyperbole. Now, what was hyperbole? It's an extended exaggeration. So it may be that a lot of these, in a lot of these imprecatory psalms, what you have is an emotional exaggeration begging God to act. Yeah, you know, act. You know, they're wanting God to know how strongly he feels about this matter. So he says, in essence, God, wipe out all my enemies. Wipe them all out, right? Now, does that, do we have problems understanding that sometimes? Does, do, do we, have you ever heard that idea? 
where people would say, well, I don't know if I believe the Bible, if God is, if they're asking God to destroy people. Then we also think about the idea. I was reading a book this afternoon written by a universalist. Anybody know what a universalist is? No. Somebody that has a coexist bumper sticker. <laughs> well, in a way, yeah. The universalist says that it doesn't matter. And I was just reading through this book, just cursorily reading through it. I didn't go into a lot of detail, but his point, his point is, is that God is going to save everybody. Everybody. In other words, every person on this planet will be saved by God. It doesn't matter if you obey or not. It doesn't matter if you do anything or not. It doesn't matter if you go to church or not. You're still going to be saved. And God is just going to, and God's going to save Hitler. God's going to save Stalin. God's going to save these mass murderers. You know, we punish these people, but God's going to save them all because God is just so loving and God's mercy. And you see, as I was reading through and cursely reading through this, he was saying in essence that those parts of the Bible where it talks about God's justice and God's punishment, that was just them talking. It wasn't actually inspired. So now all of a sudden, what? If I follow his thinking to its logical conclusion, then I really won't know what parts are and what parts aren't inspired. So you then have to hope that you've got it right. And if that's the case, if God is going to save everybody, you know, we can all go home and watch whatever's on television, do whatever we want to do with whomever we want to, whenever we want to, we're all going to be saved and everything's going to be all right anyway. It's not Bible. So he has to, in essence, do away with whole bunches of scriptures to believe that doctrine. So when you start cherry picking what scriptures you're going to believe, what scriptures you're not, then what? <laughs> you're preaching Satan's doctrine. Yeah. You just erased all accountability. Yeah. So the Bible has no value. That's right. So he needs to go ahead and just quit preaching because. So then what's your rule that's of it. authority? That's it. That's, and that's, that's kind of where we are in that respect. Isn't that the biggest argument that's going on today? What is truth? How can you define truth? Your truth is not my truth. My truth is not your truth, right? So everything, everything goes, right? The minute you throw the Bible away, then where do we have? What sort of standard do we have? All right, let's just think this thing through a little bit. We go a little bit further in this respect. If we get to that point, then the Nazis were right and we were wrong to fight a war against them. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. No, we weren't. We're still going to be saved anyway. Right? You see the problems? <laughs> you see where it's going to lead us eventually? But it, I guess it really amazed me that the guy had the audacity to say, well, no, those parts of the Bible just don't fit. But then, so what that does, okay, Hitler as a bad guy mm -hmm. because he didn't go to church. Mm -hmm. You go to church and commit evil but you're better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm not as bad as him, right? The difference is Hitler didn't go to church. We have a lot of people in the world that believe in the Bible. They may so called baptize or get mm -hmm. young. Then they pay to live a sinful, live a, a, a God life, mm -hmm. die. And at the funeral, what they want to sing and pray in the heaven. Mm -hmm. But you look down on him. Mm -hmm. All because he didn't go to church. The atheists will make an argument that Hitler was a Christian. That Hitler was a Christian. And they say, well, now you see, it's not atheism that does it, causes these mass murders. It's, but actually the actual format of, uh, and I'm getting off on the subject, I need to get back here. But atheism lends itself to exactly what Hitler did. To eliminate entire races of people because they are what? Evil. They're, they have got problems somehow or another. So Jews, they would kill autistic children. They would kill, you know, older people. You see? So that's, that's how it all plays out. The moment you, you, you lose yourself from that mooring, then anything goes. And that's where we are in this country. 
we even not even, we don't even have to talk about it in Hitler, but how many people that maybe if you talk to, friends of yours said, well, I go to church and I'm a, I'm a Christian. Well, I'm just as good as any of those folks down there, right? You ever heard anybody say that? And you see, that's where we are in this country right now. So the question is, will we get back to what the Bible says? So you again emphasize the idea in these Psalms that, that God is, at, or they're asking God for destruction, but it's an imprecatory Psalm. Again, <clears throat> this, these kind of Psalms exposes the world's violence and oppression, and it gives the victims an opportunity to express their outrage. Okay. David would actually use this against some of his enemies. God destroyed my enemies. And you think about David, David, for a long time, he had to run from Saul, right? And there were times whenever he, he just, just really wanted to read second Samuel chapter 22, Psalms chapter 18 kind of fit together. But the thing is, is he would, he would ask God to destroy his enemies, right? All right. And then you would have what you call dirge Psalms. Dirge, D-I-R-G-E, what is that? Lamentations. You're crying. It's the morning right, weeping and wailing over despair of irreversible loss. And Psalms like 30, Psalms 35, uh, Psalms 44. The entire book of Lamentations is a psalm of lamentation, right? So that's a dirge, all right? Then you have another way you could look at some of these poetry is songs. A lot, you have a lot of Thanksgiving songs. Thanksgiving songs, for example, is Psalms 30. Uh, another Thanksgiving song, the royal Thanksgiving song would be Psalm 18 and Psalms 21. Uh, and a lot of, even in, think about it in this respect, you, you have um, um, hymns. How many of those hymns do we sometimes sing as young people? right? Think about that. Have we ever sung the Psalms 23 as a hymn? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do it all the time. So you have Thanksgiving songs, you have hymns. Again, you have coronation hymns, such as 2 Kings chapter 11, verses 4 through 12. You have love songs. Love songs? Read through Song of Songs <laughs> or Song of Solomon. That is a, a, it's a group of love songs. It really is. So, and again, a lot of times maybe we don't even realize just how, how he, he does bring that point out. You have <clears throat> liturgies. Now, what is a liturgy? It's called to praise. Psalms 118. Liturgy. L-I-T-U-R-G-Y. Liturgy. Okay, it's it's a, it's uh, the call. It's a it's kind of like a responsive call. For example, Psalms 118. There's the call to praise. In other words, the call to come to worship. Then you have a response. Then you have a call. You have a response. Then you have a call and you have a response. Then you have the petition and they thanks, thank God for what they have, and then they call you to praise God again. All right. So it, it, if we're trying to compare it today, we would compare it to a lot of denominations where they would read a passage of scripture, the preacher would get up and read a passage of scripture and the congregation would respond. Okay. And then you would have another person or the preacher reading another passage of scripture or somebody, and then the congregation would respond with another. Yeah responsive readings. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what we're talking about here. And Psalms 118 seems to be one of those kind of, kind of Psalms. Okay. And then you have wisdom Psalms, wisdom Psalms, such as Psalms 1, Psalms uh, 19, Psalms 33, 39. Okay. Psalm, yeah, 1, 19, 33, 39, 49, 127. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the denomination of the world took that incident, that event, mm -hmm. and made it a 
Good. 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 Yeah, I, I think I know which who you were talking about in that particular place. And uh, I, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I'm trying to see if it's actually in here. It's in John Genesis chapter 31. And let us make a covenant between you and I. And they gather stones and they call it this heap is a heap of witness between me and you. May the Lord watch between me, you and me, when we are absent one from another. Okay? Yes. Okay, now, but then he goes on, if you afflict my daughters, and if you take other wives beside my daughters, although no man is with us, God is witness between you and me. Well, they only get the part, the first part. They don't get the last part when it comes down to that responsive reading. So if you get married to somebody else besides my daughters, then we're, you know, then the Lord is going to be the witness between you and me. And that was Lot and, I'm excuse me, not Lot. It was Laban and Jacob. Jacob and Laban, okay? So, all righty. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, okay. How do you interpret poetry? All right, now again, a lot of times when we're talking about poetry, we struggle with this because we were brought up thinking about some of these poems and how you interpret them. And sometimes we try to apply this with the psalm and you can't do that. So you have to interpret these things in their entirety. You have to look and interpret them in their entirety. All right? You always need to look at the psalm in its historical setting and uh, uh, understand it from that viewpoint, all righty? That's the main way you do it. That's the main way, as always. Anytime you're studying scripture, you've got to look at it from its historical setting, see what it meant to those people that day, then what? Make the applications to us today, all righty? Now, let's talk about prophecy. How do you interpret prophecy? We're still dealing with the Old Testament. All right, now this becomes interesting, right? <clears throat> prophecy. You have different kinds of prophecy, just like you have different kinds of poetry, right? All right, now, a prophecy of disaster. Think about Jonah. What was his message? Yeah, and it's interesting as well. He only, as I think I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago when we were studying Jonah a little bit, we talked about the idea that everything in that book's upside down. The prophet, is the one that has to be reproved, right? The sailors had more faith in God than Jonah did. Jonah was trying to run from God, right? And then he is vomited out of the belly of the great fish. But then when he goes to Nineveh, is he really happy about being there? No, no. <laughs> absolutely not. And then what was his message? Yeah, well, I'll let him perish. Yeah, repent or perish. And he doesn't even tell him what to do. He doesn't, well, you go back, he doesn't even say repent. He just says, in essence, 40 days and this city will be destroyed. And you don't, of course, we might sit back and we, I guess we automatically assume that he obviously told him to repent, but nowhere in the text does he say repent. He just says, this city is going to be destroyed in 40 days. He didn't tell him what to do. So the king takes it upon himself and all the people repent, right? Read that very closely there. So again, let's not try to put anything in there that the Bible doesn't put in there. So that's a prophecy of disaster. And again, every prophet does this. Amos will spend the first two chapters talking about all of the kingdoms surrounding Israel, the 10 northern tribes, and saying, God's going to destroy you. God's going to destroy Edom. He's going to destroy the Philistines. He's going to destroy this. He's going to destroy, he's going to, he's going to have, he's going to give an account. Judah's going to have to give an account. But then when he comes down in the second chapter, I believe it's beginning in verse seven, he then starts listing all of Israel's sins and all the others. It's just one or two sins that God is going to punish him. But when he gets to Israel, the 10 Northern tribes, I think the list is about seven. So the point is, is he's saying, okay, if God's going to hold these folks accountable for this, 
Look at what you're doing, and God's going to hold you accountable for this, okay? So again, again, a lot of these situations you would have, you have in these uh, prophecy of disasters, you would have uh, a prophetic commission where the prophet is told to go and preach to whomever. He would tell about the situation, and then again, he would give us the prediction of what was going to happen. Some other examples. Elijah regarding Abijah in 2 Kings chapter 1, 3 through 5. He says, you go up. Well, let's re look at it very quickly. 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. Now, here again is this prophecy of disaster. And who's the prophet here? It's Elijah. All right. <clears throat> And so as you're reading this, 2 Kings 1, 3 and 4, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria. Now what had happened is Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper room in Samaria. One brother put it this way. He was working on his back deck and fell off his back deck. Okay? Maybe <laughs> that will help us to understand this a little. He fell off his back deck. He's injured pretty badly. He's not sure if he's going to make it or not. So he sends his wife, he sends his, excuse me, he sends, he says, go and go to inquire of Beelzebub to see whether or not I shall recover from this injury. There was another situation where he did that. So here he is. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go meet the messengers and say to them, is there no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? So you hear the prophetic commission? The prophetic commission was what? Go talk to those messengers and tell them what's going on there. And he says, thus you shall say, you shall not come down from the bed in which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. So there's a prophetic commission. Uh, commission. Here's the situation. They were going to Beelzebub. And what? Elijah meets him and tells him, no, you're not going to get any better. You're going to die from your injuries. And so when the messengers returned to him, he said, why have you come back? Obviously, it would have taken more time to do that. And they said, a man came up to meet us, said to us, go return to the king. Thus says the Lord. He says, you should not come down from the bed to which you've gone up. And he said, what kind of man was it that told you these words? A hairy man wearing the leather belt around his waist. He said, it is Elijah. So then he sends him down. He's going to capture Elijah with 50 men. Remember? Remember how all that played out, right? Sends the first 50, and the first captain said what? Come down, he says. Uh, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you. Boom, they were gone. Again, immediately, a lot of us are sitting there thinking to ourselves, boy, this is kind of rough. But you see, it was the prophetic commission. These guys were going to arrest the prophet of God. And God is emphasizing, no, you need to have respect for me. So he sends down a second, second 50 men. And this man, man of God, thus says the king, come down quickly. Now notice he just said in verse nine, the first one just said, come down. The second one said, come down quickly. You hear his arrogance. And what happened to that 50? They're gone. So the third one came down and what? He fell down on his knees before Elijah. And he says, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Fire has come down and destroyed the first two, but let now my life be precious in your sight. And God spared those. What lesson to, What lessons do we have here? Pride. But you see the emphasis upon the prophetic commission. All right. <clears throat> so there was that prediction. And before the end of this passage, the Bible says in chapter one that I has die, has I died. All righty. Secondly, there's, there's basic types of prophecy, the prophecy of disaster. Now the prophecy of, let me see if I can find my, oh, there it is. The prophecy of disaster, the prophecy of salvation. Prophecy of disaster. And the prophecy of salvation. Can you think of any passages in the Old Testament where you have that happening? Huh? Isaiah 53. Yeah, we immediately think of Isaiah 53. 
let's uh, let's put it back more. You've got that ideal of that salvation there, and that's right. But uh, here's an example in Jeremiah 28. Um, <clears throat> he emphasizes the idea that he's going to break the yoke of the king of Babylon, Isaiah chapter two, you know, those two suggest the idea there. He said, uh, the basic statement of the prediction is I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And then within two years, I'll bring back to this place all the articles of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar took. You will bring back to this place Jehoiakim and all the others. Well, they made a prophecy. Hananiah made this prophecy concerning Jehoiakim, but it didn't happen. That particular prophecy did not happen. And the bottom line is, he said, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And he said, it happens within two years. Did it happen? No. The Israelites were taken into captivity. The Judites were taken into captivity, right? So there was that prophecy of salvation. Another one is Isaiah 53. Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 2 through 4. Okay? All righty. <clears throat> what was the one in Amos? Huh? Amos chapter 9, verse nine. 15. And it's interesting, the last thing he says in Amos, beginning in verse 15, was the fact that there was going to be salvation. And he's actually prophesying of the fact that the kingdom of God was going to come, talking about the church, even in the book of Amos. He's emphasizing that there. All right, the woe speech, or the prophecy of woe. This is not woe like a horse, but oh me, bad things are going to get bad. And woe is me. For example, he will say, woe for those who devise wickedness and evil deeds on their bed. All righty. <clears throat> Micah chapter two, verses one through five. Micah chapter two, verses one through five. Woe to those who devise iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hands. They cover, covet fields, take them by violence, also houses, and seize them. So they oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. So what's God going to do? I, against this family, I'm devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks. You will walk haughtily, nor shall you walk haughtily, for this is an evil time. In that day, one shall take up a proverb against you and lament with bitter lamentation. We are utterly destroyed. So what are they doing? They're thinking about evil all the time. And he says, as a result of this, you're going to be punished. All right. <clears throat> okay. Then you have, again, the prophetic. This is this word again, prophetic dirge. What is a dirge? Morning. And lament, right. It's a lament, all right? Uh, <clears throat> let's go to, uh, let's see. Make sure of the passage before I ask you to turn there. Amos 5, yes. Amos chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Amos 5, 1 through 3. Okay. Hear this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There's no one to raise her up. The city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left. And that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. So what do they need to do? Now you hear the dirge, you hear the lament, here's the lamentation. If you've got, you've got a city of a hundred and there's only ten left, that's... That's not good, is it? No, a thousand, again, that's not good. So here's the thing. He says, seek me and live. Now notice how this, this pops up again. In verse chapter, Amos chapter five, verse five, seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel nor enter Gilgal. Bethel and Gilgal were the two places where Jeroboam had set up the altars in the Northern Kingdom. Remember that? He said, don't go to Bethel. Don't go to Gilgal, seek me and live. 
Verse six, seek the Lord and live, lest he break out fire in the house of Joseph. Now the 10 Northern tribes were mainly the Ephraimites, right? I know the, it was the majority of the Ephraimites, but the Ephraimites were the ones creating some of the problems. So that's the reason. And, and who was Ephraim from? The house of Joseph. Okay. So he says, verse five, verse four, seek me and live. Verse six, seek me and live. Verse 14, seek good and not evil. Verse 15, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gates. So they're going to go on and he's he going to now, remember I talked to you a moment ago about the prophecy of woe. Look in Amos 5, 18. Woe to, the, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. In other words, they're saying, well, we just can't wait till the Lord comes and, and finishes it all. Oh, really? <laughs> Are you really prepared for that? How often do we say sometimes? How often do we say, well, I just wish the Lord just go ahead and end this thing, right? We've got to be careful what we pray for, right? Don't get me wrong. I understand that if I'm right with God and where I need to be, I, I have nothing to fear. But at the same time, these people were saying, and they were kind of looking at it cockily, they were saying, well, let God give us, give us the worst. Okay, is that really what you want? No, <laughs> no way in this world, you see? And you hear also this a little bit of what, one of the other things we talk about, the idea of sarcasm here, right? So he's telling them and emphasizing this idea to them. All righty. The other passages that bring out this, Isaiah 14, 4 through 23, Ezekiel 19, uh, Ezekiel 26, 17 through 18. So... <clears throat> Then you have prophetic hymns, all right? Prophetic hymns. <clears throat> and what is a prophetic hymn? It's kind of a song. Listen again, the same text, Amos chapter four. Amos chapter four, verse 13. Behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is and makes the morning darkness who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Do you hear the hymn? It's a praise to God, right? What did God do in chapter four, verse 13? He made the mountains. He created the wind. He told man what, and, and this should wake us up. He could tell us what our very thoughts are. Yeah, whoa, that's, you know, sometimes my thoughts are not always Christian thoughts. You know what I'm trying to say? So it's, it's something to make, make me woke up, wake up to the fact the Lord God of hosts is his name. So you have, again, this, this hymn as it was. So you have that, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Here's another hymn. He made the Pleiades and Orion. Now, what is the Pleiades and Orion? Star. Stars, constellations, right? All right. He turned. Where, where are we at again? I missed. I'm sorry. Where were we got again? I missed that. Amos chapter five, verses eight and nine. Okay, thank you. Okay. He made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning, makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Now you see verse 13 of chapter four. And then in chapter five, verse eight, you have again, this ending up with what? The emphasis upon who God is. Yahweh is his name. So he reigns ruin upon the strong so that the fury comes upon the fortress. So here's yet another one of those prophetic hymns. Go on in Amos chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Amos 9, 5 and 6. <clears throat> the Lord of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river in Egypt. He who builds his layers in the skies and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. What? Yahweh is his name. The Lord is his name. Okay? All right, let's take about a five-minute break, and we'll come back and pick up with this a little bit more. All right, we're back to where we were, all righty? Um, we were down to... Um, we talked about earlier the idea of prophetic hymns. 
now we're coming back to okay thank you all right i'll work on that in a minute now we're back to prophetic liturgy now remember the word liturgy we had talked about that a moment ago and what did we say it was call of praise yeah but it's also responsive readings a lot of times, right? Remember, we emphasized the idea that it was probably a lot of responsive readings. So you even have that in some of the prophetic scriptures as well. The two parties are worshiping in response to one another. All righty. Let's go to Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah chapter 14. By the way, what is the longest book in the Bible? I would say Psalm. That's the longest chapter. Oh, the longest book. Yeah. What's the longest book in the Bible? Mm. <clears throat> Years wise, it's Genesis. <laughs> The longest book of the Bible in the Hebrew is Jeremiah. It's actually Jeremiah. Okay. That's just a little bit of trivia, interesting trivia for, you'll probably forget it. It is. Yeah. It's got 52 chapters in it. Yeah. So Jeremiah, and, and, and in, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, Jeremiah is longer than the Psalms. Okay. And then if you add in the book of Lamentations, which most people do believe he wrote, Mm -hmm. the longest books in the Bible. All righty. So that's just, that's just a little interesting little deal that, that encourages you a little bit. All right. Now what you're going to have here is the Lord is going to be talking about a drought. He's talking about the droughts. Now, a lot of times to get God's people pick up their attention, what would he do? He sends droughts. He sends locust plagues. He sends famine, things along this line. So here, you're having this idea. So what do we find? Judah mourns, her gates languish, they mourn for the land. And the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded. Now, as you listen to this, it kind of sounds like what? It kind of sounds poetic, right? Just the way they're saying it. But it also kind of sounds like, again, you have in your mind, can you picture the nobles actually going, sending their young men to get water, and they can't find any? And then they were ashamed and confounded. Why? Because they didn't do what their master had told them to do. Why? Because the ground is parched. So you have the verses two and three that emphasizes the idea of them going out to get the water, but why, you know, and, and it goes on a little further, no rain in the land, the plowmen were ashamed, they covered their heads, notice verse three, they covered their heads, they covered their heads, so there's that idea, the, the deer gave birth in the field, but left there was no grass, the eyes failed because there was no grass, now, you, you hear the description of what's going on, there's no water, why? Our iniquities testify against us, so you hear the complaint, all right, so he says, do something for your name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you, O oh, the hope of Israel, his Savior in time of trouble. Why would you should be like a stranger in the land? Why would you like be like a man astonished for the mighty one who cannot save? Yes, you, Lord, are in our midst. So here again, you're among us. You bear your name. Do not leave us. We are called by your name. Do not leave us. So here you have the first part. You have the idea of, as you start off, we're suffering because of the drought. Then he cries out to God, now what? Verse 10, God answers. But here you have again, still the idea of the liturgy, what? You have a response, only this response is between Jeremiah and God, right? So what does God say? They have loved to wonder. They have restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sins. So the Lord said to me, do not pray for this people for good. So he, he really lays it out there. 
<clears throat> they, want, they would love to do all of this, so don't even bother to pray for them. Wow, that's kind of bad when God says, Jeremiah, don't pray for somebody, right? But he said that's exactly what's happening. You have the same idea as found in Joel chapter uh, 1 and 2. Joel 1 and 2. We talked about Jeremiah 14. Joel 1 and 2. All righty. So this is prophetic liturgy. Another great passage that could talk about this would be Habakkuk. Where again, Habakkuk is keeping or talking with God about the, the problems they're going through. Habakkuk chapter 1 and 2. 1, 1 through 2, and then 12 through, uh, let me say 12 through chapter 2, verse 1. So him and God are talking about what's going on at that time. So there you are. All righty. <clears throat> Questions, comments, thoughts? Prophetic liturgy, a response as it was. Now, another type of prophetic literature, prophetic disputation. In other words, they're in a dispute. Now, one of the first ones that comes to my mind is Jonah chapter four, right? Where God and Jonah is arguing with one another. <laughs> and of course, remember the fact that, that, that he's arguing along, along with God there, right? Another passage is Amos 3, 3 through 4, all righty. <clears throat> Amos asked the question, can two walk together unless they've agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground where there's no snare been set? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the trample attempt or do not the people tremble? So he says, and, and you hear these series of questions. He's asking these questions, 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 questions. I'm going to Amos, Amos, okay? So he says this, and here's the conclusion. The sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The ideal is this. God was going to punish his people but he did it, he was going to do it, but he also, his people, what? His people deserved it, but they were gonna know what was happening so that they would not be totally surprised, number one, but number two, so that they would know why the punishment was coming, right? If a parent takes care of his child or her child, she sits the child down and the child misbehaves, so punishment has to happen. But you're gonna sit down and explain to the child why, right? Otherwise, what? They may not get the message. They may not get the lesson. I have to do this because this is what you've done. I There's, never told why. Huh? I said, I was never told why. <laughs> you were never told why? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not storming out there right now, and I'm glad for that, okay? <laughs> no chance of lightning hitting in here right now at this moment in time, but... It, but anyway, wow. So, so you never. Okay. Her parents were, knew she was smart enough. She knew why. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's also be honest. A lot of times when we saw the punishment coming, we knew why. We yep. knew what we done and we knew why we did it. But now, you know, and again, even God dealing with his people, a lot of times they're sitting back like they engage in it. And then they're kind of like, you know, uh, it's kind of like their eyes get wide open. Oh, Lord, you meant that, <laughs> right? And he does have to punish them because of this, right? So here's, again, that disputation. So there, he's asking these questions, and, and so there's where he's going through. All right? You have a prophetic lawsuit. You have prophetic disputations. You have prophetic lawsuits. Now, what is a lawsuit? This is a, a metaphor. A comparison, right? God being the prosecuting attorney and the judge. Micah 6, verses 1 through 5. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> All right. Hear now what the Lord says. Plead your case before the mountains 
and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint. Now, the Lord hears what? He's not just the judge, but he's also the prosecuting attorney, right? So who does he call as a witness? Who does he call? Who's the jury? It's the mountains that he has created, all righty? He says, you strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. So he asked this question. What have I done to you, my people? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I brought, redeemed you from the house of bondage. He said, I set before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, what Balaam, the son of <clears throat> Beor, answered him from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, calves a year old? And so here's the first part of it is God prosecuting his people. And he's saying, here's it is. So now the people will give their response. Well, okay, God, if you're, you're this way, then what am I going to do to please you? And notice what he says. With what shall I come before you and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before you with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Well, you remember the Old Testament law commanded that, didn't he? Right? Shall, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Do you hear the hyperbole here? 10,000 rivers? That's an, extent, it's an exaggeration, right? It's almost sarcastic. <laughs> Do what? I, I, was, I, just, I was listening to it thinking it's almost sarcastic. In a way, it, it is, but it's also like, God, would you be pleased if we could give you 10,000 rivers of oil? But think about it in this respect, who has the oil to begin with? God did. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, so then they ask the question, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? Now, key in on that phrase, as you read in the book of 1st, 2nd Kings and 1st, 2nd Chronicles, some of the reason why these people were destroyed was because they were offering their children mm -hmm as sacrifices to these idol gods. God, do you want my firstborn son? But you also think about how God in the Old Testament said, look, the firstborn are all mine anyway, right? Remember that? So then you come to verse eight. God said, he has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to what? Do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Three things that keep us busy for the rest of our lives. Number one, <laughs> do do justly. What does that mean? What did God want of the children of Israel? What does he want out of us today? Right? To do justly means you live the righteous life. You do what's right. That's it. And again, going back to what we talked about earlier, if you throw the Bible out, then anything goes, then your right is your right. My right is my right. And, you know, then anything goes right. You see what the problem is? That's where we are in our culture. And you see, slowly but surely, that's where we've, we've got to start with a lot of these people and emphasize to them that the Bible is the word of God again, right? But again, the devil's been working a whole lot harder than we have. To do justly. To what? To love what? Mercy. mercy. To love mercy. What is mercy? What's a synonym for mercy? Grace. Grace. So we need to be gracious and forgiving like God is. God is gracious and forgiving, right? And he wants us to walk how? Humbly. With who? With God. So you see, God has, you, you have this lawsuit here, and God has said, that here's where it is. Now, there's other places where this is found. Psalms chapter 50. Psalms chapter 50. Sermon. Huh? I said, that's a good sermon right there. It is. It's a great sermon. And again, it's a sermon that needs to be preached today. Isaiah chapter 1, 2 and 3. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. Jeremiah 2, 4 through 13. Hosea 4, 1 through 3. This, this idea of the prophetic lawsuits are brought out over and over and over again. All right? 
where God is the prosecutor and the judge. <clears throat> All righty. Yeah. Okay. Don't cut the alarm off. Got you, brother. Thank you. All righty. Then you have a lot of prophecies against foreign nations. Against foreign nations. I feel Amos starts off with. He starts off the first two chapters talking about all the kingdoms around Israel, and then he goes and zeroes in on Israel. You'll find this in just about every prophetic book where they're not only going to be talking about the sins of Israel or Judah, but they're also going to be talking about the sins of Edom, the sins of Philistia, the sins of Egypt, the sins of Babylon, the sins of Assyria, the sins of all these others. So again, there is a lot of these prophecies over and over and over again. And then you have a lot of visions, a lot of visions. You have prophetic visions, right? Can anybody give me some examples? Without me giving a bunch, I'm <clears throat> giving some. Prophetic visions. Prophetic visions. <clears throat> How about Daniel chapter nine? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, Daniel chapter two is Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but in Daniel chapter nine, uh, he's praying because the 70 years are up and he sees uh, Michael come talk to him, right? And there's that, that whole vision there. And he starts that vision in chapter nine and goes through the 12th chapter of what he, and actually is being, if we were using Star Trek terminology, transported through the future until Messiah comes, okay? Uh, you have Isaiah 53, obviously, is that vision. You have a lot of these visions over and over and over again. Uh, and these dialogues with God, uh, Genesis 15, Amos 7, 8, uh, on and on and on it goes, okay? So you, you've got all these different kinds, again, all these different kinds of genre when we're talking about prophetic things. So... How do we go about interpreting these things? All righty. How do we interpret it? Number one, again, remember that <clears throat> prophecy is a biblical phenomenon by God, which God conveys message to his people through human speakers or writers. Now, I'll slow down. Prophecy is a biblical phenomenon by God or by which God. It's a biblical phenomenon by which God conveys message these messages to his people to his people through human speakers or writers Most prophecy involves foretelling. Not foretelling. Most of the time when you talk about prophecy, you know, people get all, you know, oh, it's going to tell us the future. No, it's foretelling, not so much foretelling. In other words, he's preaching to the people of that day. They're preaching to the people of that day. Now, you just, Brother Tidwell, you just glitched on my computer. I didn't catch any of what you just said last three seconds. Okay. You're preaching to the people that day. Or the near future. Okay. Okay. Or the near future. So, for us to understand the prophecy, and it involves foretelling the people of that day, what necessarily has to happen? We have to understand the historical situation. We have to understand the historical situation in which the prophet speaks. We need to know the history as much as we possibly can. This last week, I was preaching on Acts 12, where Herod killed James and was about to kill Peter. And I took a few moments and read, just read out of Josephus, about the kind of man Herod was. 
And I talked about how Herod was the grandson of Herod the Great. You know, there's, as you look at all the Herods in the Bible, we get kind of confused because you have Herod the Great that killed the babies. Then you had Herod Agrippa, you had Herod Agrippa the first, you had another Herod, Herod Antipas. <clears throat> yeah, he was the one that, that uh, was upset with Jesus, or excuse me, John the Baptist. Oh. Yeah, uh, upset with John the Baptist, killed John the Baptist because he said that it was not lawful for him to have his wife. Why? Because Herodias, Herod, Herodias, and all that. Oh, you want to talk about a wonderful family. That was a wonderful family. You ought to sit down someday. <laughs> if you if you if you never had your mind blown, you ought to sit down someday and try to figure out all those Herods that's found in the New Testament. And buddy, they were if you think your family's a piece of work, just look at that one. That's all I got to say about that one, okay? You couldn't make up what these people did. But anyway, the point I was trying to make is you need to know which hair that was. It wasn't the guy that tried to kill the babies. It was his grandson. And so I just read where he had actually had been in the court of Tiberius Caesar. And Tiberius Caesar, depending on what, of course, you also got to understand Tiberius. He was a fickle guy. So one day, Herod, this, this Herod Agrippa I, might be in his good graces. The next day, he'd be in prison, <laughs> you know. But before it was all over with, Tiberius just sends him out of Rome and lets him take over where his granddaddy. He actually had more land, more of a kingdom than Herod the Great had at that time. But he also had a lot of his granddaddy's traits. And that's why he thought, okay, I'm gonna play politics. I will make the Jews happy. So you see, by doing that, that helps us to understand what was going on in Acts chapter 12. So we need to know the historical situation. <clears throat> Number two, you have to determine the kind of judgment the prophet announces. Determine the kind of judgment that the prophet announces. A lot of times you will find, like in Isaiah and especially in Jeremiah, the punishment will be talking about a future exile and they're gonna stay in the land of Babylon for how long? 70 years. And Jeremiah would actually tell them that in Jeremiah chapter 25, okay? Isaiah will use that idea of future exile. And again, Amos, Micah, and some of these other prophets. So number one, understand the historical situation. Number two, determine the kind of judgment the prophet announces, okay? Number three, you have to pay attention to the reasons given for the judgment. Pay attention to the reasons given for the judgment. All right. You remember Deuteronomy chapter 28? Deuteronomy chapter 28 gives us the um, blessings and the curse. Remember that? the blessings and the curse of Deuteronomy chapter 28 comes into play there. The Israelites are in a covenant relationship with God, so they were going to be cursed if they don't want obey that covenant. So as you're talking about foretelling, look at the historical situation, the kind of judgment, and pay attention to the reasons given for the judgment. All righty? All right. Now, as you interpret this, sometimes... This is where the foretelling part comes in. The foretelling part. And sometimes, and what do I mean by foretelling? They're actually looking into the future, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's look at it from that viewpoint. <clears throat> um, so we're trying to interpret this foretelling, all righty? And this is what gets kind of blows our minds sometimes. This is where we have some troubles or understanding some things in passages of scripture. Let's look quickly at Isaiah chapter nine. All righty. Now, in Isaiah chapter seven, here's the historical circumstances. And I think I may have shared this with you before. Again, if I have shared it with you before, please forgive me 
If I haven't, then you, you'll, you'll get it. And again, the reason I say, I, I make that disclaimer because I'm not sure where I say what to who anymore. You know, I've been teaching on this in, in the class, my Bible class at, at church. So I may not have even mentioned this to you. If I have, the Bible says you got to love me and listen to me. <laughs> <All right. laughs> if I repeat myself, here, here it is. So everybody is in Isaiah chapter seven, right? And we're very familiar with this passage, especially in Isaiah chapter seven, where he emphasizes the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, right? Mm -hmm. And Matthew chapter one does give us the fulfillment. Matthew says, this is what Isaiah was talking about, right? But let's try to remind ourselves that what's going on here. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Joseph, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. So here you have Ahaz, who was the son of Uzziah. Reason, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. Okay? Now, what's going on historically? Well, here's what's happening historically. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Up here, you have the Tigris and the Euphrates River flowing down to the Gulf. And up here, you have the nation of Assyria. Now, here you have, and this is kind of the way it is even today, right? You have Israel. Over here is a desert, okay? So, you know, I got to get this, I got to get this straight. So this is kind of more like this, all right? It's kind of going like that, all right? And you have the 10 northern tribes, and Bethel was here, Gilgal was here, and right here was Jerusalem, all righty? So, that's the historical circumstances. Now, Assyria, Assyria is about to attack Israel. Now, again, right, what's, what's right here? It's desert. So, they're not going to come down. They're going to follow the water. So, they're going to come down this way. Now, above Israel is what nation? Syria. What is the capital of Syria? Damascus. Damascus. Oh. Where's the capital of Syria today? Damascus. Damascus. Okay, that hadn't changed, all right? Damascus is one of the oldest cities in the world, all right? Just keep that in mind. So you have the king of Syria and the king of Israel getting together, and they need manpower to stand against Assyria, all right? So what do they do? Well, they combine their forces, but they know that's not going to be enough because these Assyrians, they're nasty people. Go up and look if you have the opportunity to do sometimes. Go to the YouTube and type in National Geographic um, Assyria. And it's about a 30-minute documentary, documentary. And it talks about just how vicious the Assyrians were. The Assyrians were the, really the first nation that had a standing army. And what I mean by standing army, they were paid soldiers, okay? These people were vicious. They were very vicious. Go back and you read where they would have literally in the Assyrian uh, catacombs and the Assyrian uh, uh, relics that we have, they would have pictures of heads in baskets just, just you know, laying there. They were the ones, interestingly enough, that started the ideal of crucifixion, only <clears throat> by the time the Romans, the Romans had perfected it. But their idea is they would a lot of times impale you on a stake and leave you laying there. <clears throat> You'd have to die. They, in other words, you would be put on this stake and just left to hang there. Okay? Sometimes you'd last two or three hours. Can you imagine the pain and the agony for two or three hours? By the time the Romans come on the scene, they have perfected the ideal of crucifixion, but that's where it all starts. These people are vicious. So they said, we need a bigger army. So they said, we need to get Judah. And Ahaz is saying, no, you're not going to use my forces. Uh-uh, not going to happen. So these two kings, Reason and Pekah, decide they're going to attack Jerusalem. And they're going to set up Tabeel, the son of Tabeel, as a puppet king. And they're going to get all of Judah's forces to be able to fight against Assyria. That's the background. 
So this was happening. It was told to the house of David saying Syria's forces are employed in Ephraim. Now Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. Ephraim again is what? Israel. So the Lord said to Isaiah, go now and meet Ahaz, you and your son, Jerseer Jashub, at the end of the aqueduct. But say to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands. Now you hear what God calls them? Smoking firebrands. In other words, they're not even on fire. They're just smoking. All right? He says, for the fierce anger of reason in Syria and the son of Remaliah. They plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it. And let us make a gap in a wall, and let us set a king over them, the son of Tabeel. Tabeel. Thus says the Lord, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is reason. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken, so there's not a people. What's he saying? Is Assyria is going to take the ten northern tribes into captivity. By the way, when did that happen? Anybody remember dates? No? All of us are good at dates in history, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were taking my history of Israel class, you would have to know the dates. I'm sorry, but that's just the way you have to play out. 722 to 721 BC, Assyria took the northern tribes into captivity. Okay? So, he said, in 65 years, Ephraim, the 10 northern tribes will be broken. And what? It will not be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, you will not be established. So he then says, speak to Ahaz, saying, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it whether it's in the height or in the depth. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now, Ahaz was not, go back and you study about Ahaz. Ahaz could care less about what the Lord wanted. Ahaz tried to make an uh, agreement with the king of Syria. He actually pays tribute to the king of Assyria. Okay? But Ahaz also sees a, an altar that the king of Assyria had built, and he demanded that, that uh, the exact same altar be built down here in Jerusalem where God's house was. So that's the kind of guy this was, all right? He could care less about the Lord. So he sends Isaiah to tell him about it. And Isaiah says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. This dude was hypocritical. I'm not going to test God. Well, he says this. All right, you have, you have wearied men. Are you going to weary me too? The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people in your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Jerusalem, or from Judah. So here's the prophecy of the virgin birth, right? And 95% of the time when we think about this particular prophecy, we immediately think of Jesus. Amen? Yeah. But this has a dual fulfillment. There's two fulfillments here. There's a, there's a lesson here. He talks about the virgin, the virgin in the Hebrew. So what particular virgin is he talking about? It could be a virgin girl that had not yet been married. Okay? That's a possibility. Because if this was going to be assigned to these two kings, how could something that happens 700 years later be assigned to these two kings? Uh -huh. It can't be. So what he's saying here is that in the time that it takes a virgin to be married, to be married and have a child, and that child get old enough to be able to start eating solid food, curds and honey, right? These kingdoms are going to be gone. Now, Matthew takes this very same passage, and I always, and I'll emphasize this, and I really want to make it clear. When, when a New Testament writer takes a passage in the Old Testament and applies it to a specific situation, 
Acts chapter 2, quoting from Joel 2, 28 through 32, right? Mm -hmm. yep. We have to understand that that is what it means as well. So I think that there's this idea of the dual fulfillment. In the time that it would take for a child to get old enough to do this, two or three years where he's able to eat food, Syria and Damascus are going to be gone. Okay? But now, interestingly enough, he goes on from here in Isaiah chapter 7, and he goes on, and this, this continues on through the ninth chapter. All right? You keep reading this. He will say in verse chapter 8, Assyria will invade the land, and Assyria does invade the land. During the days of Hezekiah, Isaiah 36 through 39, Assyria does invade, all right? I'm sorry. Hezekiah was during the time of Babylon. Back up a little bit. Assyria did invade the land of Judah, and Judah has to, play, has to pay tribute to Assyria. Even in the days of Ahaz, this king, he's going to have to pay tribute to Assyria. But you see, his idea was is he will, when these two guys were going to attack him, he cuts a deal with Assyria. Politics never change, folks. All right? They never change. The names change. Politics never change. All right? So these two guys are going to attack him. What does he do? He goes up here to Assyria, and Assyria says, okay, as long as you pay us tribute, we're going to help you out. They come down. Assyria takes this, 10 northern tribes into captivity. He takes Syria. It's out of the picture, and Judah's sitting there resting pretty simple, right? So that's what's happening. So we go on. In chapter 8, he says, <clears throat> Assyria will invade the land, but what do you need to be doing? You seal the law, you among my disciples, chapter 8, verse 16, I will wait on the Lord. I will hope in him. I am the children whom you've given me. And then we come to chapter 9. In chapter 9, he says, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he's expanding on Isaiah chapter 7, okay? Isaiah chapter 9 now is talking about who, for sure? Jesus. What is Jesus doing? He's going to be set up over his kingdom, and notice everything he says there about his kingdom. This is, again, is something that could be preached. Again, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, as you look at this particular passage, look at it very closely. Uh, do you see a comma after the word wonderful there? Yeah. <clears throat> Got to remember that they didn't put a lot of punctuation or anything like that in there. The punctuation in a lot of these situations uh, in the Hebrew um, <clears throat> it's not there because they didn't, uh, they didn't want to waste space. Okay. So I'm thinking, do you hear that? What does that mean? I'm thinking. Opinion. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> for that anyway. All right. My thinking is that comma should not be there. So it should be called wonderful counselor because notice every other word, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of peace. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think wonderful counselor is not two different designations as much as he's, a, he's the wonderful advocate. First John two, verse one, right? Mm -hmm. We have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, right? So he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Now that's interesting right there. That's a whole nother study right there, right? Everlasting father, prince of peace. On the increase of government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. And that harkens back to second or first Samuel, no, second Samuel chapter seven, right? To order establish it with judgment and justice, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Then he goes back in chapter nine at verse eight and starts again talking about the punishment of Samaria. All right. Now this this kind of just kind of blows our mind a little bit, but you find this prophetic stuff going on. He's talking about events of that time, foretelling, but many of these same things could be used as foretelling events 700 years in the future. And sometimes some people get too wrapped up in one side or the other. And they say, well, the virgin, how can this virgin, how can Jesus' virgin birth be a sign to these two guys? 
that are about to attack. So they say, Isaiah, Matthew, whenever he quoted Isaiah 7, 14, he was wrong. Really? You're going to go there? Yeah, they, they're willing to go there. You know, they're smarter than God. All right? Because they're saying the situation that was described in Matthew chapter 1 cannot have any meaning to these people right here. Dual fulfillment. There's a lot of passages that kind of have that dual fulfillment idea. All right? So again, what we've got to learn to do is to work through that. So you have that. And what it does here is two things. When you're talking about the foretelling and foretelling, they're talking about the present age. So whenever you read Isaiah 7, 14, he's talking about the present here, right? But the foretelling part of it talks about the future. It talks about Jesus coming in Matthew chapter 1. Dual fulfillment. All righty? And Scripture, okay, so are you saying at um, Isaiah 7, 14, the first half of 14 is the answer to verse 13? Isaiah 7, 14. If you read, yeah. If you read uh, verse 13, mm -hmm. it said, Hear ye now, house of David, it's a small thing mm -hmm. for you to worry men. But, but will ye worry my God also? Mm -hmm. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Give you a sign. That's right. Stop there. Mm -hmm. That's for verse 13. <clears throat> then the second half, behold, a virgin. That's a, a something futuristic. It is, as, I'm, as I tried to explain it, it could have been talking about a virgin there at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And in the time that it would have taken that virgin to have a child, and that child to grow up to the point to where it could eat curds and honey two or three years, these kingdoms are going to be out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do, you pass on the name? How do you pass the name Emmanuel? Okay. Again, think about what does the word Emmanuel mean? God with us. Okay. So again, even you can look at it from this viewpoint, the word God with us, if that in the time that it would take for that child to get to that age, God has still what? Been with Judah and delivered him, right? Not literally in the flesh, but what? Did God save Judah at this time? Yes, he did. God with us? Yeah. Right? Now, the Emmanuel key comes into play a little bit later as well in Matthew chapter 1, right? Mm -hmm. Where he says what? We shall, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, and they're specifically talking about God becoming man, Jesus Christ. All right? Dual fulfillment. Dual fulfillment. And there, again, there are other passages that, that emphasize that. Uh, so you have the present and the future. The present, the future. And there's other passages that emphasizes uh, this idea. Um, <clears throat> Y'all chew on that. I tell you what, this is probably the best place to stop for tonight. Let's stop there and I'll pick up with that next week. Y'all study on that. Think about it. And then if you have any more questions, we'll discuss it a little bit more. All right. A lot of times we try to make it one or the other, right? And we've got to be careful. I think the prophet is talking about both. All righty. All right. Thank you, brethren. I appreciate it. And uh, hang in there. Any questions, comments, email me. I did send you the midterm. <laughs> I, was, I was having a hard time trying to get everything done. So I said, here's the midterm. Give me a list of 20 things you have learned in the class thus far. 20 things. You want to talk about an easy test. I don't know how to be easier than that. You know, I'm such a loving, benevolent dictator. <laughs>